The South Pacific, 1942. The U.S. Marine Corps leads the attack on the Pacific Islands of the Japanese Empire. And for the first time in their history, they launch an amphibious assault with tanks. They knew they would have to have that type of support to knock out defensive positions in amphibious assaults. All of a sudden, our tank hit a hole. They were throwing everything but the kitchen sink at that thing. People say, well, I didn't realize there were tanks in the Pacific. They seize one island fortress after another. There's no real way to carry a large cannon around the battlefield for direct fire infantry support except a tank. But they face an enemy ready to meet them tank versus tank. Man, we were firing and firing and firing. Fighting across a battlefield as wide as the ocean itself. If they hit them, they're gone. Tanks go head to head in the Pacific War. Today, the palm-fringed beaches of the South Pacific are a destination for holidaymakers seeking paradise. But in World War II, they would become a blood-soaked graveyard for the U.S. Marine Corps. In December 1941, the Japanese launch a surprise attack against the United States naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Striking at the heart of American power in the Pacific and dragging the U.S. into the Second World War. For more than 50 years, the Japanese have been pursuing a policy of aggressive military expansion. Their empire now stretches halfway across the Pacific Ocean from mainland Asia. The Japanese military machine has been unstoppable, swallowing one island chain after another, from the Marianas to the Gilberts and to the Solomons. Japan's strategy was pretty effective at this particular point because basically they had managed to run riot all through the southern Pacific. They had things pretty much their own way. Each island in its possession is now a fortress, bristling with manpower and heavy armor. The goal was to make it so expensive for the Americans to come back and to counterattack them that the Americans would lose hope and simply give up on recovering or counterattacking the Japanese and seizing back this empire. But give up, they did not. And in June 1942, with a decisive naval victory at the Battle of Midway, the Americans turned the tide of war. A common saying is that before Midway, the Japanese never stopped advancing. After Midway, the Japanese never stopped retreating. The Americans go on the offensive, and it's the Marines who are tasked with rolling back the Japanese empire across 6,000 kilometers of ocean, with the plan to seize one island stronghold after another until they reach mainland Japan itself. Overshadowed by the achievements of the infantry, the role of the tank in the Pacific War has been untold. People say, well, I didn't, I didn't realize there were tanks in the Pacific. There's very little written about the tanks in the case of the Marine Corps. The infantry always has this strange love-hate relationship with tanks. They don't like to be around the tank because it takes fire. But when you're taking fire from an enemy position, there's nothing quite like that direct fire cannon and those heavy machine guns and that armored protection to help eliminate enemy positions. There's no real way to carry a large cannon around the battlefield for direct fire infantry support except a tank. The Marines' first hurdle is Guadalcanal, which they seek to take with overwhelming force including 20,000 troops and more than 50 light tanks. 
but it becomes a protracted and bloody campaign. Not only are the Pacific Islands garrisoned by tens of thousands of soldiers, but the Japanese are also fanatical in defense. They never give up. You either kill them or get killed. This is war. They don't, they don't give up. And crucially, the U.S. Marines' frontline armored weapon, the M3 light tank, proves a failure. The light tanks did not possess enough firepower with their small 37 millimeter cannons to do much against the uh, major Japanese defenses. So the light tanks of the Marine Corps are replaced with the Sherman. The medium M4A2 Sherman tank with a 75 millimeter main cannon, its firepower is a significant upgrade in the Marines' armored capability. How do they compare? Uh, like night and day. It was kind of like comparing a small Ford to a big Cadillac. With the lessons learned at Guadalcanal, a victory that takes six months and comes at a cost of more than 7,000 casualties, the U.S. Marines move on to their next objective, Tarawa. 6,000 kilometers from Tokyo and part of the Gilbert Island chain, Tarawa is at the outermost edge of the Japanese Pacific Empire. It's a remote and sparsely populated atoll of tiny islands and coral reefs. The Japanese realized, having executed several amphibious assaults themselves, that the best place to defeat an amphibious assault is at the water's edge, where the troops are still wading ashore, where they're still knee-deep and struggling. So most of their defenses were sited around the perimeter of the island. So confident is Japanese Rear Admiral Keiji Shibasaki, he boasts that a million men could not take the island in a thousand years. Dug in behind the defensive seawall at Tarawa are 5,000 soldiers, 65 heavy guns, and seven tanks. These islands were so small that the entire perimeter of the island could be fortified. So there was no chance except to assault these things frontally. Advancing on Tarawa, the Americans now have 14 medium tanks, dozens of light tanks, and 20,000 Marines. November 20th, 1943. At 0500 hours, the American attack begins with a massive naval bombardment. Its aim, to destroy the Japanese defenses and breach the seawall. We could see the, the planes dive bombing the island. The heavy cruisers were there, they were they had 12-inch guns, and they were blasting the island like crazy. What I was worried about is I was worried about what them things might hit me. <laughs> At zero, 0900 hours, the first wave of Marines go in. On a small island like Tarawa, the only thing you can do is attack right into the teeth of the defenses, just kind of slog ashore and try to do the best you can in this frontal assault. Three waves of Amtraks lead the attack, followed by C Company with 14 Shermans. A kilometer from the beaches, they're unloaded on a coral reef. Then you go in. And that's when things got rough. 
because it's now that the U.S. tankers come within range of the Japanese heavy guns. All our positions on all beaches opened on enemy landing craft. The Americans appeared to be surprised and confused. Wading ashore through three feet of water under murderous fire, the tankers encounter an unforeseen hazard, the shell holes created by their own naval bombardment. All of a sudden, our tank hit a hole. They were under fire. I mean, they were, ever, they were throwing everything but the kitchen sink at that thing. So I opened the hatch and slid down the back of the tank into the water. And I don't know how I did it without getting hit, because all I could hear in the water was put, 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 put all over. And of the six tanks I had on that beach, three of them drowned out in the water. But we did get ashore. With, I got ashore with three vehicles. But far from being destroyed, the Japanese seawall is still intact, barring their way and effectively trapping them on the beach. The tank couldn't, you can't drive over that five foot uh, seawall. And they had built, in some cases, positions actually into or just atop the seawall. It was a very effective defense with interlocking fields of fire. What remains of C Company must now run the gauntlet of the anti-tank guns, desperate to find a breach through the seawall. And if they could manage to fire into the area behind the tracks, they could penetrate the very thin armor there. They would simply pump rounds into these tanks until they were destroyed or caught fire. Two tanks from Bale's company find a gap in the seawall and make it off the beach. It has now taken the U.S. Marines six hours to establish a beachhead on Tarawa. And the cost has been high, with 50% of their tank capability already destroyed. Looking back on it, uh, we're pretty naive because the intelligence did not reveal the true nature of the Japanese defenses, the tenacity of the Japanese. But with the seawall breached, the tables have now been turned. It was strange. All the Japanese defenses were oriented seaward, and we were on shore. so that once you could get in behind these things, you could knock them out by attacking the rear entrances without coming under so much intense fire. You had to find the opening because these things were dug into the ground and they were covered with mounds and mounds of sand. we realized you had to start firing in the openings. But we had not gone more than 100 yards inland and we ran into this Japanese tank showed up. When I saw him, and I caught him out of the corner of my eye, this movement. And I realized what it was. The Japanese tank stuck its turret up over a revetment. I told the gunner, and he started to traverse over there. He probably had to traverse that gun 30, 40 degrees to get on that target. <laughs> 
and he fired before I told him to. And he missed. That was a prepared position for the Japanese tank, where it could sit there and then drop, pull up, put its turret and gun up over the revetment and fire. And that's what it did. The Hago light tank, armed with a 37 millimeter main gun. In a straight fight, it should prove no match for the medium Sherman M4. That projectile hit right on the end of our gun tube. Took a piece out of our gun tube and fragments came down the tube and it lit up like a Christmas tree. It was a lucky shot. With a lucky shot. Bale's tank is disabled, but he has backup. The other tank that was with us fired. And that other tank fired, and all I know is he blew the turret off. We call them a tin can. And that's what they are. I mean, compared with our tanks. It takes three days for the Marines to clear the atoll. 4,700 Japanese are killed, including Rear Admiral Shibasaki, with only 17 choosing to surrender. And in the space of just 76 hours, the Marines themselves lose nearly 1,000. Taro caused a major change in the way the United States viewed the war and the attitudes, particularly. Because up to that point, on the home front, movies had always you know, depicted people with relatively bloodless shoulder wounds or people dying with a noble you know, quip on their lips. But for the first time, the Commandant of the Marine Corps authorized the release of photographs of American casualties, including dead Marines on the beach, dead Marines floating in the lagoon. And he made the comment, there is no royal road to Tokyo. Having punctured the Japanese Empire's first line of defense in the Pacific at Tarawa in the Gilbert Islands, the Americans now advance on the Marianas and the island of Saipan. The Japanese considered the Marianas actually the last defensive line before the home islands. Much bigger than Tarawa and halfway to Japan itself, the Marianas hold the strategic key to the war in the Pacific. The Japanese know that if their airstrips on the Marianas are captured, American Super Fortress bombers will, for the first time, be within range of Tokyo itself. So they were prepared to defend these things uh, with a major effort. June 15th, 1944 the U.S. Marines launched their amphibious assault. Saipan was the first of the real large land masses that the uh, Marines attacked during the course of the Pacific War. So the Japanese could not have as heavy a, a defense of the beaches themselves. We did not encounter the... the, the bomb craters and all off the beach. We didn't encounter the heavy Japanese gunfire from emplacements. And as far as I was concerned, uh, uh, I got my company ashore pretty easily. Unlike on Tarawa, the main Japanese defenses are situated behind the shoreline. And as the US Marines advance off the beaches, they discover the Japanese are waiting for them dug into a network of almost impregnable bunkers. Oh, they had pillboxes all over, and they were connected underground. 
they were in a pillbox over here firing, and, and, and before you know it, they'd go underground to another one and come up again. Which means the U.S. Marines have to clear and destroy each defensive position. One by one. So the Marines not only had to kill the defenders of position, they had to physically destroy that position to keep it from being reoccupied. And the only way they can do that is to burn them out using the newest weapon in the U.S. Marines' armory. The Satan Flame Tank is a reconditioned Stuart M3 light tank. It's 37 millimeter main cannon, refitted with a Canadian-designed Ronson flamethrower. It was an absolutely deadly weapon against any sort of fixed position, because it doesn't really kill the enemy by burning, but it consumes all the oxygen and suffocates even somebody inside a closed position. With a range of just 55 meters, the flamethrowers are only effective at close quarters. The flame tank had to approach within a certain distance, rendering itself vulnerable to enemy counterattack by infantry with these uh, little grenade mines or a, a suicide weapon they call the lunge mine, an anti-tank mine on the end of a bamboo pole that they would come up and shove against the side of the tank. They had a lot of success sticking these against the engine doors on the light tanks where the armor was much thinner. The Marines' advance now becomes a game of cat and mouse with the Japanese suicide bombers, with the Sherman supporting both infantry and flame tanks. So it was simply a matter of working with the infantry and slow going and digging these people out. Then we went down about 1,000 yards toward a big pillbox about 20 foot high. I mean the big one. I started throwing the shells in there. We fired about, oh, I'll get eight or ten shells of that thing. And nothing would happen, they just they just fell off. Just like me, me shooting my BB gun at my barn out here. They just hit it and, and roll off. Can you imagine? They nothing can get through that. We pulled back and uh, the light tanks had flamethrowers on them. There's no way you could knock that thing out. You had to burn them out. That's the only way you could do it. But with its limited range, the Satan tank needs protection. I was more concerned about being swarmed by the Japanese than I was about the Japanese gunfire. So the idea was, of course, that these escort tanks could stand off in some position. Uh, off to the side, to the rear, wherever required to protect the flame tanks from this type of counterattack. So they, they took flamethrowers up there and they burned them out. So as they burned them out, why well, we picked them off. By day's end, a beachhead has been established. But the Japanese on Saipan are far from finished. As the U.S. Marines clear the Japanese defenses on Saipan, the Japanese tank formations that have been held in reserve prepare to strike back. The Japanese principle was always to try to counterattack. They had a um, almost a cult of the of the attack and the counterattack. Whether we attack or not, 
we are going to die. Let's advance together against the American devils and leave our bones on Saipan. The problem is, it came to be a kind of a situation where they saw dying in one of these things as almost a kind of a goal into itself. As night falls at the end of day two, the U.S. Marines reach one of the island's airstrips. At 0330 hours, the heavy rumble of Japanese tanks can be heard approaching. The Japanese came over this ridge line. Must have had every tank they had on Saipan. Because I don't know if anybody ever saw any more Japanese tanks. It was a big, big attack. A big attack for an island like that and a force like that. They had sent in major units, including the largest single Japanese tank unit that the Americans encountered during the course of the Pacific War. 37 tanks lead the Japanese charge, a full frontal bonsai style attack straight at the American lines. A bonsai attack is just a maze of confusion. It's just, just simply a horrible maze of confusion. Like anything at night, you can't see. You're not sure, but you know it's there. Can you hear it? Man, they came up over that ridge. And man, we were firing and firing and firing. They just came at you and kept coming. Taking the Marines by surprise, the Japanese smash through the American front line and the battle becomes a mass brawl of tank versus tank. As they advanced two or 300 yards, uh, they encountered the anti-tank company and, and this tank too. It turned into just a huge melee with things all mixed in together. Tracer bullets light up the night sky. Explosions and shell bursts illuminate the battlefield. With tanks firing at point-blank range, the Japanese Hago now finds itself hopelessly outgunned by the U.S. Sherman. And typical. Japanese tanks didn't stand a chance. The Japanese armor, they had little light tanks there, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't do any good. Their 37 millimeter guns were not big enough. Their armament was not heavy enough. Our medium tanks blew the light tanks away. Flames from the stricken tanks now enable the Americans to pick out their targets. One of the aspects of the Japanese tanks was that they were, you know, their design was such that in a lot of cases, you could actually knock them out with heavy machine gun fire. And there were instances where they smothered these things with enough 30 caliber heavy machine gun fire to actually get rounds through the vision embrasures, through small chinks in the armor and kill the crew inside, disabling the tank. We just kept, kept mowing them down. But the more we mowed down, the more, the more can. This thing went on all night long. By dawn, the Americans were able to come out over the battlefield. And there were about 33 Japanese tanks, you know, in various stages of uh, 
disrepair, shall we say, strewn about the battlefield. Well, walking around there looking at that after it was over, you know, it looked great. Looked great. It kind of looked like going out on a baseball field after your team wins a baseball game. The action on that night succeeded in destroying about three quarters of the major Japanese armored force on the island. After that night attack, the Japanese had no more, had no more tanks left. Although outnumbered and overwhelmed by superior American armor, the Japanese defenders on Saipan refused to surrender. It will take the U.S. Marines another three weeks to clear the island. At the end of which, they will be confronted with the final horror, the mass suicide of Japanese civilians. They were scared as Americans. They thought they were going to get killed, mur murdered, and raped. And... They were up on the end of the island there, and you know, they all, they, the, whole, the whole family would just jump off the cliff at one time. Women throwing their children off the cliffs. You know, I don't know if, how anybody could have uh, stopped it. All it really had to do was raise a white flag, and, and we wouldn't do nothing to them. With the capture of Saipan and the Marianas, the Americans are now within range to launch daily bombing raids against Japan itself in preparation for a full-scale invasion. But Iwo Jima, a tiny volcanic island situated halfway between Saipan and the Japanese mainland, remains a thorn in the American side. It was a Japanese radar base that gave them hours of warning of the approach of the American raids. And Japanese fighter planes flying out of there were picking off uh, crippled American bombers trying to make it back to the Marianas. Measuring just 21 square kilometers, Iwo Jima is an unremarkable dot in the ocean. But the battle that raged here would make it infamous in the annals of the US Marine Corps. February 19th, 1945. To their surprise, the Marines' amphibious landing is unopposed by the Japanese. Contrary to the defense of the water's edge, at Iwo Jima, what they had planned to do was to actually let the Americans come ashore. The first problem that presented itself at Iwo Jima was simply the nature of the beaches. A lot of the beach sand is not sand in the sense we normally think of it, but volcanic ash. And a man jumping out of a landing craft and struggling up onto the beach, when he got into the dry sand, every step you took, you sank in up to your knees. Vehicles uh, just floundered in it, tanks trying to advance through it. The tracks would begin to churn this material, but the tank would be sitting on its belly with its tracks churning and just throwing up uh, ash and sinking in deeper and deeper and deeper. When we hit the beach, that loose volcanic ash had built up into the tracks to where w one of the tracks exploded. As the first tanks advance off the beaches and get onto firmer ground, they encounter a new danger. What they were doing was burying a 500-pound bomb about that far underground and then setting a 10-pound anti-tank mine on it. In some cases, these were command detonated. They, they could be detonated electronically by somebody waiting in a nearby cave. 
The American tanks push on, not knowing when or where another mine will strike. The tank went up in the air, the turret come off and landed right side up. And the tank went over. The driver and the assistant driver, they're dead before the dirt clears. made a hole big enough to almost bury the, the tank in, and everybody in it was dead. Each step taken by the U.S. Marines on Iwo Jima will be fraught with unforeseen dangers. One military engineer who looked at the island of Iwo Jima after the battle said that it was probably the most heavily fortified place on the planet. To protect themselves against magnetic mines, the tankers have bolted wooden planks to the sides of the Shermans. But as the Marines are about to discover, the Japanese no longer have to rely on suicide attacks. Because for the first time in the war in the Pacific, Japanese gun capability is now a match for the Sherman. One of the major obstacles that the American tanks had to cross uh, was two interconnected airfields on the central part of the island. And the real problem was that a lot of the Japanese anti-tank guns had been positioned to defend this open ground because they knew that this central plateau was going to be a major axis of advance for any sort of tanks. The idea was just smother them with artillery fire, and that's what they did. There was mortars and, 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 and big guns flying all over around them. It was essentially built up as one huge ambush. The 47 on Iwo, that's the first time we met the 47s. The breech-loading 47-millimeter anti-tank gun. With a barrel length of two and a half meters and a muzzle velocity of 830 meters per second, it presents the first serious challenge to U.S. armor in the Pacific. Yeah, they would go through the tank anywhere it wanted to. As the tanks advanced over this relatively open terrain, these 47 millimeter anti-tank guns, and in, this case, in some cases, larger guns, were able to fire into the sides and rear of the tank. You know, anytime you penetrate the engine, that's going to disable the tank. So it was vulnerable, you know, to, to fire if it was engaged from the rear. There are photographs of tanks that have anywhere from 12 to 15 penetrations on one side of the tank alone. Yeah, a lot of... A lot of tanks were done in. It's really always difficult to assess how many tanks were knocked out in any particular action, but the estimate for this one is somewhere around 33 or so. The American advance is slow and the cost is high, but it's also unstoppable. 
And on the fifth day of the battle for Iwo Jima, the U.S. Marines plant the stars and stripes on the summit of Mount Suribachi, the highest point on the island. And Joe Rosenthal's photograph will become an iconic image, not only of the Marines' triumph, but also of their struggle. It will take another 30 days of the fiercest fighting in the whole of the Pacific War for the Americans to secure the island. And with 26,000 wounded or killed, it's the only battle in which the U.S. Marines suffer more casualties than the Japanese. We had all kinds of good information, but uh, whether it was going to be as bad as it was, I don't think we had any idea that it was, it was going to be a month long, but uh, it got dangerous. I, uh, a lot of guys bought it, a hell of a lot. By the spring of 1945, the Axis powers are on the brink of total defeat. In the Pacific War, the U.S. Marine Corps has fought five and a half thousand kilometers, halfway across the ocean, to reach Japanese home territory. Okinawa, 600 kilometers from the mainland, is the first of the home islands to be attacked. But with nowhere left to retreat, the Japanese are prepared to defend Okinawa and their homeland to the death. I figured we'd have to, to fight the whole Japanese, you know. And it's bad because they're going to fight, they'd fight to the last man. April 19th, 1945. The battle for Okinawa is raging. Working in tandem with ground troops, 30 tanks advance against Japanese infantry positions on Kokuzu Ridge. Tanks are very vulnerable to close infantry assault. When a tank comes under attack by enemy infantry, the preferred method is having your own infantry with you. But in the heat of the battle, the U.S. tanks lose contact with their own infantry. They sent a lot of the medium tanks out into Japanese-occupied territory unescorted by infantry. Undefended by ground troops, the column makes a power drive through enemy lines, which are teeming with anti-tank guns. They had all these artillery pieces and heavy anti-tank guns in caves. And they'd roll them out and fire them, and they were good at it. Twenty-two tanks make it as far as Kokuzu Village, a booby-trapped Japanese stronghold. Where lacking any ground reconnaissance, the tankers are ambushed. Cut off, deep within enemy lines, and with no hope of reinforcement, the tankers' only chance is to blast and burn their way out. I mean, those people are trying to kill you, and you're going to kill them. That's it. Of the 30 tanks that set out on the mission, only eight return. Kokuzu Ridge is the last major tank engagement of the Pacific War, although Okinawa will not be taken for another two months. Losses on both sides are dreadful, with more than 100,000 fatalities. 
But however desperate their defense of their homeland, the Japanese cause is now hopeless. By June 1945, Okinawa is secured. On August 6th, the Enola Gay takes off from the Marianas to drop the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And within a week of the second bomb on Nagasaki, the Japanese surrender unconditionally. Of all the campaigns of the Second World War, none was more fiercely contested than the South Pacific. For the Japanese, the cost is enormous. Total defeat and more than two million casualties. Casualties for the U.S. Marines alone amount to more than 95,000 men. But ultimate victory is theirs. You do your job. You don't... All you do is get in before he gets you. That's, that's the name of the game. And central to the U.S. victory was the role of the tanker. I feel proud of the tankers. Tanks are always part of it. I've always been very proud of that tank of me. They wouldn't have went away without tanks, as far as I'm concerned. But the, between the tanks and the ground troops, that's what took the islands. 